So, hi, can everyone hear me without the microphone? Yeah? yeah. Awesome, because I don't think I can juggle both, so I'm sick with this. So, hi, I'm Kelly. I'm a biology student at the University of St. Thomas. This is the Nash Prairie. Looking at this photo, you see that prairies are an incredibly biodiverse ecosystem. And this photo gives a hint of that. Yet there's an entire ecosystem. Can this work? Yeah. Ah. There's an entire ecosystem here that we don't see. And that is, there we go, the microbial landscape. We think we don't interact with it, but we do. Site managers will create compost teas by soaking compost in water and then spraying it onto the soil to provide nutrients for the plants. What they don't realize is they're also spraying microbes. Microbes are just everywhere, just in the air and things, but they're especially present in compost because it's through microbes that these food scraps are able to decompose into soil. Microbes cover a broad range of organisms. They include eukaryota, like fungi, shown here in their mycelium state, and nematodes. There's also prokaryotes, like archaea and nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Bacteria that fix nitrogen are important to the ecosystem, and they're there from the very start. It's because of these, my it's because of these bacteria that plants are able to access nitrogen, because they fix the nitrogen gas from the atmosphere down into the soil in a form that the plants can then use. It's not just bacteria that do this, but a fungi do it too. There's fungi called my mycorrhiza, and you can see, you know what, I'm just gonna move here. Sorry, left-handed. <laughs> and you can see it here in the soil, it's completely surrounded this plant root and it's all these little strings. Mycorrhiza form a symbiotic relationship with these plants. They provide the plant with potassium and nitrogen that the plant couldn't get from the soil otherwise. And in return, the plant provides them with a source of carbon. There are over a billion microbes in just one gram of soil. And we have no idea who they are or what role they play in the ecosystem. This isn't entirely our fault. We didn't have the technology for this until very recently. Sequencing technology has opened up a whole new field of scientific research and has allowed us to look at microbes in a whole new light. On the other hand, it is kind of our fault <laughs> because let's face it, we're biased towards larger organisms. I about jumped out of my car to get a picture of these quail at the Katy Prairie. I spent just five minutes looking at this spider because, I mean, just look at that egg sac. I haven't reached this point for microbes yet. <laughs> but just because they're not as exciting to take a photo of doesn't mean that they're not as important. A team of researchers in the Midwest looked at cultivated soils and remnant soils and compared the bacterial composition. They found that the communities of these two soils were entirely distinct, and they were surprised to find that a bacteria called Verucomicrobia were highly abundant in the remnant prairies, yet they were completely missing in the cultivated soils. This is because this bacteria preferred soils that were less nutrient-rich. This raises questions about the roles microbes play in the environment, and specifically what microbes are there. These are questions we want to answer with our project. We're interested in understanding the relationships between microbes and plants. We've hypothesized that certain microbes will aid prairie plant establishment. The previous study only looked at the top soil of the soil horizon. And also because I was told to point this out for my soil folks, this is a soil horizon. It shows the varying layers of the soil that differ by composition as the depth, deep, as it deepens. 
we're going to be looking at the topsoil and the subsoil in our five areas. As you can see, our project covers a lot. We have the microbial composition on these sites, the soil conditions, which means we'll be looking at the macro micronutrients, the pH, and the soil organic content. We'll be taking our data from both of these and comparing it with the presence and diversity of prairie plants on the site. With time and hopefully good data, we'll be able to form hypotheses about best management for restoration plans and be better able to advise the local restoration community. We have five sites that we've designated for sampling. They include a mix of remnant and restored prairies. The remnant areas include Rock Hollow Creek. This site is unique because it has a saline bank there. This means that this soil is much higher in salt content. There is Deer Park to the east. This prairie is the wettest of all five sites, and it's also covered in Mima Mounds. Then to the south is the Nash Preserve which is the location of the picture that I showed you at the start of this PowerPoint. It's one of the largest remnant prairies in Texas. Our restored prairies include MD Anderson, which is just downtown. It's a newly restored prairie, but it's already started providing ecosystems for various birds and insects. Then further south is the Seaborn Creek Prairie. This is much larger than MD Anderson, and it's also been in the restoration process for far longer. We want to look at the microbial compositions of all five sites and find patterns. We want to see if there's microbes that are present in all, or if there are microbes who are only present in remnant, and then why are these microbes missing in the restored? At each of these sites, we've established a sampling area. We want to standardize it as much as possible. This means that we're not sampling anywhere near the sailing bank of Rock Hollow Creek, and we're also not sampling near the Mima Mounds at Deer Park. We also need to take into account the weather because the increased soil moisture in the soil could change the microbial composition. We need to make sure we don't take any so sampling within a week of a rainstorm, which has been a little bit difficult with this winter. <laughs> At each of the sites, we're going to lay down a meter by meter quadrat. Within this quadrat, we'll be identifying all plants within this. And I'd love to give special thanks to Dr. Brown and Jetta Blacka for their help in identifying these plants. From them, I've learned that no, you really can't identify a plant from just one tiny little leaf, no matter how enthusiastic you are. Because the plant communities will vary depending on the season, we, we're expecting the microbial landscapes to change as well. This means we're going to be sampling throughout the year. We'll sample in the winter, spring, and summer. Within these quadrants, we'll be doing the microbial sampling. We'll do microbial sampling using a core, and here I can add an extension to it so we can get further into the soil. And as you can see, it takes a little bit of elbow grease to use. When you pull up the core, this is what you'll get. We can measure the distance into the ground and then remove our, our layer of interest. You'll notice that I'm wearing gloves. This is because we don't want the microbes on our skin to contaminate the microbes that are, we pull out of the ground. We've also, this is a large concern, so we've also been experimenting with how to clean the core and purge it between sites. To increase standardization, we need to take sampling within one day if possible, or if not, within two days. So this means we'll be jumping around sites as much as possible. Outside the quadrant, but as nearby as we can, we'll be taking the soil, soil composition tests. We don't want to do this within the quadrant because we'll be digging up a good amount of dirt to do this. And we don't want to disturb the site 
more than we have to. Okay. The way how this works is that we're all hopefully human in this room. Now, we know we're individuals because we can determine it by our DNA. Microbes are much the same. You can extract the DNA from the soil, amplify and sequence a barcode region. And this barcode region will then tell you the genus of the bacteria, bacteria or fungi. This, isn't, this technique isn't as accurate enough to get to species level yet, but it can at least show us motifs in the DNA, which we can compare to other known bacteria, and then we can make hypotheses about what these bacteria and fungi do in the ecosystem. You notice that all of this is just for just one bacteria, and that there are over a billion in a gram. So repeat this to the X amount of times. Thankfully, there are robots for that. Our soil sampling will also be taken to a lab as well at Texas A&M. Well, they'll test the soil conditions. So far, we've chosen our sites. We've compiled a list of native plants to better identify and more quickly identify plants while on site. We've studied soil composition and looked at the testing techniques. And from this, we were able to choose our labs at Baylor and at a and We've also been optimizing our sampling procedure because as you saw, we have a lot of ground to cover in just one day at best. So we need to go through these sites quick and as accurately as possible. We'll start sampling in December. We'll repeat this sampling in March and July of 2016. We hope to you we hope to use microbes to make, to restore prairies in a more efficient and a faster way. If we can find a microbe of interest that we believe works for remnant prairies and might be a key component in establishing prairies, we then want to look to see how we can get this microbe into a restored prairie. Well, one way that we could do this is by inoculation. We'll, take, we'll use experiments and take a plug of soil from the prairie that has the microbe of interest and place it into a mix of soil that does not have the microbe. We'll then do soil sampling and test to see if this microbe spreads into the ground and how long it takes and how far. We want to be able to use our results and our data to aid the re restoration community and to be more eff efficient in their methods. We want to encourage people to consider microbial compositions along with prairie plant selection in the future. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Oh, so any questions? Do you have any preliminary data from any point samples you've taken so far about the pattern for the five or six sites? So far, no, because we haven't even started taking sampling yet. We've, we're hoping to start in December, right. but so far we've just been studying the different plant compositions and the different soil compositions we can be looking for. We don't really know that much about the microbes in the prairie, so beyond what, such as the previous researcher did, but they didn't do it in the area that we're interested in. So, yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> well, hopefully is what we're hoping. Yes? Did you find a similar plant structure in your quadrats? There are definitely some, and to be clear, we haven't quite laid out the quadrats yet, but I've, when we compiled the list, I compiled them by species, and you can see that on certain sites, there will be plants that will continuously pop up, but those are typically the grasses, and the restored sites, because they seed them specifically for that, it's a given that they'll be repeated in uh, the site selection. Yes, 
but there is also the fact that we're kind of also looking for the unique plants, which will only show up at one. And that's kind of what we're hoping for, but just the fact that we will see definitely a mix, and even if there are the same amount of the same types of plants at each site, we're not so sure we'll see those same amount of plants in the quadrat that we throw down. I, I didn't know if that would help standardize. For choosing the plant areas, I did try to choose sites that looked, I suppose, similar-ish. We could tell that the outliers, like there are Spartana grass, which are only present at Rock Hollow Creek, and we considered sampling there, but we thought that might throw off our results too much. So we wanted to better standardize this by sampling away from the Spartana grass. But I mean, Gulf Muley is a pretty good uh, indicator. And we saw at Deer Park that the Gulf Muley won't grow on the Mima mounds, but only in the flat lying areas. So that's what we aimed at for these uh, sites. Though there weren't any Gulf Muley at MD Anderson where we put down our sampling. Sorry, that was long. I question, uh, you might have mentioned this, but I know you said you're gonna take the core and the outside you're gonna do the soil profile work. Mm -hmm. Are y'all gonna be measuring in the soil profile work like soil organic matter, nutrient content, and the different things that you guys need to test? Yes, know? sir. We're going to be looking at pH, the soil organic matter, and the macro and micronutrients. Yes? We'll be sending the soil off to a lab where the, where the microbial DNA will be extracted and then we'll be given a list that just says all the microbes that are present. We'll be then basically comparing that list to the other microbes that are then present at the other plant, at the other sites, and then at the other sites, and then comparing that with the soil conditions and then with the plants present and then seeing how that changes over time. For the microbes, there's a new lab at Baylor called Divergen, who will be sending for the microbial composition. And for the soil conditions, there's the Texas A&M lab, and we'll be sending it off to them. Um, yes? So, yeah? Do you have any idea which ones you might be missing? Is it like carbon and C components? We have no clue. No clue whatsoever. Yes, sir? Do you anticipate discovery of new organisms in the process? Um, I mean, hopeful, but it's not, it's, re, it's these small little, hmm. Okay, let me say that yes, I'm really, really hoping for it, but I'm also like, can hear my advisor saying like, you know that's probably not as likely. But, so, um, fingers crossed, yes. But it's, we'll, they'll just be comparing them between uh, microbes that we already know and trying to match them up with that. So if they're... Um... I'm sorry, could you please repeat that? Well, in other words, so you're not analyzing the DNA of each microbe or, you know, that you pull out of the ground. You're comparing what you pull out of the ground to the known DNA to what you have in your data currently, right? Yes, we'll be using a blast technique. So this blast will be comparing the DNA that we get from the soil and then comparing it to known microbes. And this helps identifying, but it can also look for known motifs. So if this is a bacteria that is a highly similar to another known bacteria, even they have maybe same genus but different species, but they have similar motifs, it's likely that they might play the same role in the environment and have similar functions. Mm -hmm. Yes? A 
that's a really good question. The fact that we're looking at them, we're looking down at the A and B section, go back, the A and B layer. So I'm hesitant to say wind because these guys are mostly anaerobic, so they you know die on exposure, or or if exposed for too long. So yeah, but I know microbes can be dispersed by wind, but no clue. <laughs> Sorry, a lot of what we're doing, we don't really know what's going to happen. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you have dispersal, uh, mostly a, a lot of it is through uh, fecal matter, exudate. Cool. Yes? Uh, what's the cost of the DNA sequencing for this project? Okay, we actually, we're getting a pretty good deal because our advisor is, um, he's also on the Baylor staff. But let me think, it's... Oh shoot, no, I should have written this down. But for soil conditions, I know at least, let's see here, it'll be 50 minimum per sample, and that's just soil conditions. So microbial extraction, it'll be, I'm sorry, I can look that up real quick, but it's probably a couple hundred at least. So one sample per quadrant, how many quadrants per experience? Mm -hmm. There's, at each of these sites, there's one quadrat, but we'll be taking about uh, three, core sample, three, course, three core samples within each quadrant. Why not sample in the fall? Main, winter, spring, summer. We don't have that much of a fall. <laughs> it, because we also, due to school, most of our students who are doing the sampling have winter break off, so we can do it then. But during the fall, not so much. And we really want it to be as distinct seasons as possible. And in Houston, fall is a little hard to tell. <laughs> Are you sampling just in the winter then? No, in the winter, spring, and summer. Oh, winter, spring, and summer. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Give you a round of applause. 